it's really like the the amount of information <laughs> and the amount of people is just increasing exponentially and we had that call was Rockefeller yesterday uh, had a call was Jago uh, you're aware of Jago right yeah that's the urbanic thing or he is like affiliated kind of uh, kind of like he was creating a project on there so we actually yeah. connected with the team of um, French uh, guys their kind of leadership of Jago and it's actually pretty cool uh, I mean just as a concept and that's the same kind of thing that I was uh, ideating for years and you know if, if you check out their white paper it resembles a lot what we're trying to do organically like just facilitating all of these projects organically and giving them infrastructure with all the things that Slava is building yeah no that'd be cool to work cool. for sure so all these calls you're having are still corona y related well i would say 80 percent of them are but 20 percent is me trying to optimize my commercial activity which i completely abandoned for like march april and now i'm trying to figure out how how to still have food on the table yeah. and, <laughs> and and have life but yeah i'm definitely shifting towards uh, corona y and um you know things that are left off are basically me trying to delegate as much stuff as possible and move away from operations of collab mm. yeah cool what's up with you uh things are good yeah i'm keeping busy with my projects um yeah i don't know just just kind of filling in the cracks keeping things afloat and it's an interesting position to be in dealing with like devops and also like kind of like a pi like kind of running the lab and here, everything basically. Yeah, so I, I like that I get to wear all these many hats. Like it's a different experience that I haven't had before. So I'm having yeah. fun with it, but but it's just like juggling a lot all the time. For sure. Well, I'm personally fascinated by your ability to manage all the teams under vaccines team. Uh, like, because I was looking through that team list or project list with Kathy uh, today, and I was like, wow, I, I don't even, I don't have any idea what these teams are working on. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'll I'll keep updating during just the general calls, but unfortunately, we early on we started talking in private channels, and so there's no way to switch back, and so there's it's hard to have everyone see what we're working on because we're in private channels. Yeah, and but, uh, I think it's actually good. Like private channels serve the the actual function of not overwhelming people. I think so, and it keeps people kind of focused, and it's clear like okay, these people are actually working on certain things, and yeah, I do like that feature. Yeah, so uh, let's, uh, I, I loved your agenda for the call, by the way. <laughs> cool, cool. So, yeah, so a couple things. I mean, I, I think probably the most pressing thing is like just dealing with the Kaggle stuff because I don't want to keep Paul waiting for too long. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to like fully understand where our confusions are and what the stumbling blocks are for the Corona Med thing. So what it seems like like my impression of what paul wants is just this corona med thing is basically a nice interface where we enable easy uploading of tables and then immediately going from these kind of raw tables that the curators are actually filling in in like excel or whatever to just it populates and it looks like a nice looking website essentially and it's connected to the actual live core 19 because it's already in mongo yeah yeah so we, yeah, I'm not sure at what point it's connected with core because I'm assuming that the uploaders are like, or the, the annotators are uploading like individual tables and they're populating a lot of that stuff. But maybe the raw tables automatically get pulled from get the Kaggle API in some capacity and then annotators cool. come in, fill in the tables and then drag and drop it into Corona Med. Maybe that's the workflow. So here's how it currently works. We have port 19 version uh, 19, which is the mm -hmm. stable one. And we manually uploaded the CSV tables from Kaggle round two challenge. And those are connected by the DOI number to Core 19 collection. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, the that, purpose, I think you, you nailed the purpose, except between, you know, current version and what they want, there is some intermediary version, which is uh, completely misunderstood by me because a lot of these things like footnotes and p-values stuff don't really make any sense out of the context. And I'm just failing to understand what's a repeatable logic that goes beyond you know, 60 tables. Because we want to create something that is scalable and not just you know, fit to a round two challenge. We want something generalizable. Yeah, I agree. I think to conform to what Paul wants, it's just a matter of like creating essentially a better version of their contributions page. I think that's just his dream. It's just easy interface. It looks nice and it has the exact same features that they're like dead set on for that contributions page. And that becomes like Corona Med in this context. I do think that this kind of a tool should be thought of more generally and like maybe dealing with Paul and like getting what they want is just to get Kaggle like to, I don't know, connect us with whoever. That's again, my kind of dream. And then we kind of separately do our own thing that is probably more useful than, than that kind of a project. That's yeah. kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, and I, I'm on the same line uh, in terms of achieving that uh, goal. Like basically the, my point of confusion is uh, those crosses, you know, the footnotes, yeah. the things that are actually calculated, they're not present in the CSV files. And I'm not really sure, are we supposed to calculate them? Are we supposed to like pre-populate them from somewhere? I'm not, yeah. like, no idea. So that's where the, that's where kind of the going from raw tables to the final public tables comes in because the raw table actually has like every column is one piece of information and if you look at those like final public seven columns if you look at one of the columns it actually has like many pieces of information in it It has like yeah value it has like confidence intervals it has the odds ratio and like some text to all within like one cell so it's just a matter of like going from that raw table and kind of condensing a few fields into uh, so is it okay. like merging multiple uh, columns into one? Yeah, so there might be a specific column where it's actually you kind of put a string representation of five columns together and you serve that up in this new merged column. Okay. That's all that's happening. Well, that makes sense. And can you create a rule that for me, like uh, for all tables that contain p value and I don't know, something else? just create a new column that contains all of these X columns. There is like, because the things that they want to do are so fixed, I think that's what makes it scalable to their 60 tables or whatever. I think that you can get those, like those kinds of rules exist. Like maybe every single table has um, one column that just says P value, lower confidence bound, upper confidence bound, and like one other thing. And those, four columns will always get merged into like the one final public facing column. So there is repeatable logic there. Like it's all just a very quick scheme. Okay. Uh, are you able to synthesize that logic into like a um, Yes. I mean, from what I saw, it looked like it was all pretty, I think it was pretty straightforward, but let me double check and see if there's any like weird things. If you can take the hypertension uh, table uh, from Corona Mad and take the uh, hypertension table from Kaggle contributions page and give me a, a rule how one transforms into the other, that would help a lot. Okay, I think, yeah, like just giving a clear example would I think help illustrate because it is just it's just taking pieces of different columns and just merging them into like a string that you just put into the public facing column. Cause there's a lot of information in those like final columns. And it's just a matter of like combining together. Different things. Okay. Well, that makes it easy, easy enough. Again, it's again, hard coded logic, but we 
It's just hard. Yeah. Okay. And as for the the footers, I think all that he wants is just like literally that text and those little symbols somewhere at the top of the table, is just so that people who are reading the table can see. Yeah, that's where that comes from. But only for the tables that have this merging logic or for all tables? I think that maybe, I haven't looked at all of the tables, but I think that all or at least most of the tables have that merging logic. I, I think all of them do. For now, let's assume that. And if, if it doesn't have, like, if there's one paper, let's say, that doesn't have a p-value that they're trying to extract, that field would just be empty. I actually saw a lot of tables that don't have p-values. That don't have columns for it? Yeah, so click on Corona Man, and the first table I think is the hydrophilic, hydrophobic thing, right? Yeah, those those tables are being pulled from Kaggle contributions. Mm, those are pulled from round two CSV files because they might have updated Kaggle contributions so that every column, every table has the same like set of columns, just to have that consistency. But I'm not sure. I would have to look into that. Uh, do you have Corona Mad open? Um, not at this second, but I can get it. Let's go coronamad.org. All right. Got us a fancy domain. Nice. Um, uh, if you give me permission, I can share a screen. Oh. Uh, Hold on. Mm. Try now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you see the screen? Uh, is the screen showing up? Yep, I can see it now. Okay, so, um, so hydrophilic one, I'm clicking on that, and you're right, there is, yeah, there's no p-value column. So then my next question is, is this table out of date with what the hydrophilic table looks like on the Kaggle contributions page? So let me see if I can check that. Okay. You're right. If I look at the hydrophilic, can you see the Kaggle page? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you see this, there is no p value here. Either. Okay. So my next question then is: Is it just for the risk factors table there? This p value. And okay, there's there's one, there's two. Okay. Of the three that I looked at quickly, they all have p-values. So I think that the, re oh, yeah, the repeatable p-value logic and the coercion of, um, so if I go to that, the coercion of like five different raw, quote unquote, raw columns into the one column, like severe, which actually has many pieces of information in it, like OR, the odds ratio, this confidence interval, lower bound, upper bound, p-value. So that's like five pieces of information there from five different columns in the raw, raw table. Um, I think that this schema is fixed for all of the specifically risk factors table. Mm. And that's okay. the repeatable logic. Okay, so the rule should be for tables that are risk factors, we should include footnotes, uh, header. And we should have two extra columns that have merging rules that are combined from uh, a variety of columns to be defined, right? Yeah, and you only serve up like seven, just these seven or whatever columns, not mm -hmm. all the 27. But okay. two are derived from those merges. Well, that makes sense. And so, then the last thing is just like the coloration based on that p-value, but that's, that's straight. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So do you think you can uh, figure out which columns and uh, write up the rule? Yeah, there, yeah, I can write that up. There's two columns Perfect. and uh, I mean, have you seen the, the raw tables? So let me... Uh... I did, but honestly, all these things don't make any sense. <laughs> uh, let me, I have one of the raw tables for that. I think it's this. One. Can you see this? If so, mm -hmm. so here's one raw table for specifically the chronic digestive disorders risk factor. There are only three rows in this table, and then here are the 27 columns. So let me zoom in. A little bit. Uh, okay, so so date study. Well, let me try to pull them up side by side. Up. Yeah, we don't have to figure out the specific rule now. Uh, I, I'll let you just uh, send me or actually send a message to me and Paul in that uh, channel and have his confirmation if that's the right logic. Because we may end up, you know, building this thing and then he, he, he says that actually, like, it's wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, yeah. Um, just to quickly show the Excel. It's, I think the which ones get grouped together is pretty clear based on the column name. So one of the columns was called severe, and that's a combination of severe low or severe upper or severe p-value. I can tell you which column goes where mm -hmm. when you're putting it all together in a text, but it's clear that these one, two, three, four, five, six columns go in there. And same with the fatality, that was another column, and there's like, there's like six columns that go there. Cool. But I can, right. I, can, I can write out that logic and then run it by him. So, so I think we figured out this point. Cool. And that, that should clear up all the confusion? I think so. Uh, as long as Paul agrees, that's correct. And yeah, let's see. All right, cool. Um, so I think that we're good on, on Kaggle stuff. Mm -hmm. Besides that, I had just kind of random thoughts based on listening to Kathy and Rockefeller people talk. I don't know if you want to go into that now or you should talk about that another time. Uh, yeah, let's do a quick one before my wife kills me and tells me to <laughs> stop having work meetings. While Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, okay, so just a couple of, I guess, very quick thoughts is that one is that for, for like the Kaggle challenge and yeah, I, th I think for some of the work that they're doing, especially with like parsing out numbers from Kaggle, I think there is difficulty and, and it's kind of a harder problem than we're giving it credit for. And that's kind of come up when we're talking about like sample size, because you have issues like there's going to be dropout and like the number you enroll is not the number in the study. So that's like a challenge. The other thing that I was kind of alluding to is like p values are not completely obvious to interpret just like right off the bat. In fairness, there, probably a lot of these clinical studies are doing like just the same kind of standards like odds ratio calculation and then getting a p-value with the same kind of null hypothesis type of model. Um, but, you know, there could be like multiple p-values that appear and maybe if one study is referencing a previous study, maybe there's like some p-value there that's like not interesting mm -hmm. to you. And it's, all I'm saying is that it's kind of just like reading and interpreting and parsing the literature as a researcher like myself it's, it's slightly non-trivial so we yeah. just need to give these problems the like diligence and like uh, you know respect that they deserve and Kaggle might be playing it down too much which is maybe surprising to me because they have I think they have like Savannah Reed who's working with them and she's like an epidemiologist so she should appreciate like how tough it is to for, for some of these things how tough it should be and like issues of censorship and issues of um, like people dropping out of the study um, and like interpreting sample size like that those are problems that she's familiar with for sure yeah so i guess um let me think well i agree with everything that you said and the biggest problem that i've seen and i've realized after talking to kathy is the fact that, because she explained what p-values are and it immediately made sense to me, like it's statistical significance. 
But the fact that uh, I see a row and I don't see a conclusion to which this statistical um, significance is attached to, like just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and I think that for them putting their two columns, like one says severe and one says fatality, like the fatality column probably implies that that p-value is derived from doing a calculation of looking at like survival outcomes with or without like a treatment or with or without like a certain risk factor. So with risk factors, I think it's, it can be pretty well defined because they're just saying, if you're, smoke, if you're a smoker, uh, did that lead to mortality sooner than if you're not a smoker? And then the, the kind of test you would do in that case is pretty straightforward and like, the, like how you would calculate that p-value I think is pretty standard. And so I think that because there's enough repeatability there, it could be well-defined enough. Um, but moving beyond things that are really well defined, like drug interventions or risk factors, extracting like statistics can become very tricky. I think. And there could be lots of context that you would need to uh, give an association. Yeah, and even though like it, it sounds easier to extract quantitative data from tables, it, it, in reality, it doesn't mean it's actually easier and more useful because there is much more confusion that could you know be produced versus yeah. us just placing uh, emphasis on filtering out information or extracting uh you know just relevant entities or relevant things that don't actually mean anything because when we extract p-value we indirectly make a claim yeah, we you know have to be I, careful that we don't divorce that p-value from all the context that like properly qualifies what that thing is telling you. Yeah, and I actually think it's impossible. Like, you can't really detach that from the context. I like, think if you could you, serve up like a couple sent like the sentence, uh, oh, two like sentences excerpt. plus or minus, kind of. Okay, like that, so that like paragraphs, be right? Yeah, like paragraphs. Yeah, like it, let's, okay, it's more so narrative. I, yeah, it, actually, that brings me to a thing. We talked with Anton and, and Slava yesterday, and we decided to launch this uh, kind of idea on Joggle. And the idea is to create um, Cord19 Lens, which is a way for us, because, uh, you know, we, we are not allowed to publish full text of papers, right? Right. But we can possibly create what Google Books created, with whenever you see a book, you see specific previews, like paragraphs out of it. Yeah. So we, we could possibly create this lens something product that, you know, you see a p-value in a table and you can click lens and you actually see the context from where it was extracted. Yeah, that could be interesting. And, and that kind of thinking about like giving that context of like, a sentence or a paragraph. That's what I was thinking about with that like drug treatment extraction tool. Like I wanted to make sure that it's not just serving like the, the word, the fact that a drug is mentioned, but like, okay, here's the sentence that's mentioned and you can look for yourself. Oh, this sentence is actually garbage. If they're not saying mm -hmm. it's interesting here and you can make that call, but you're kind of given the information you need to make that call. So I, I like that way of thinking of like serving the results like that. Okay. Uh, well, it makes sense. So yeah, let, let me think, because we're trying to package kind of one pager for Juggle team to uh, process and ping to their thousands of potential contributors and mm -hmm. for them to build this web app, because that's not really like AI or machine learning right. uh, thing. It's purely web development. Right. No, they could make something like that. I mean, that'd be amazing, of course. Yeah. Um, one thing that I, I was also thinking about, because from the Rockefeller talk, it sounded like it was kind of converging towards some kind of integration with PubMed and like making search better. And so, okay, so for me, that sounds like relatively well-defined, but then the follow-ups that I have are one, like it seems like a good next step then would be talking to people at PubMed and seeing if they're open to even including these kinds of feet. Like, let's say we can make a really smart search for X, Y, or Z reason. There's a knowledge graph there or whatever. Um, are they willing to actually put it in? And I think that there might be some resistance there to get like literally the public at NLM to get it in there. 
Of so. course, and I don't envision them being supportive yeah. of any of it. Uh, what I envision is actually creating a browser extension. There, yeah, that I think that's a good way to go. Yeah. Can embed into PubMed, and basically people will still use PubMed, but on top of it, they'll see interface of whatever you know knowledge graph that we'll create. Uh, yeah, I do like that. I don't know how feasible it is to actually like integrate quote unquote with with PubMed, and if their API enables this kind of thing to work well, but. If that's possible, I think an extension sounds like a good way to bypass actually working yeah, with NLM to it, use PubMed. It should be possible by the URL. So basically, um, we don't need even like integration or API. We, I mean, it's not hijacked, but basically user gives us permission to use whatever is in, on the page and, you know, uh, extend it. Yeah. No, I think, it, yeah, I think that's a good way to go. Again, all of it sounds like a lot of manpower and man hours, <laughs> but potentially, it, yeah. at, at least it, it makes sense conception. Yeah, I think just defining like exactly the functionality of such a plugin is like the next step and being just even more precise there. Um, and there, there was kind of allusions to still like discovery and like people um, finding out what they don't know, they don't know, or something, and that kind of that was actually me. amazing because Olya. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, no, no, Olya was uh, mentioning Discovery Engine without us priming for it. You know, we, we were kind of priming for it indirectly, but she specifically said the use case where you know it would be one to one what we want to build. Yeah, I think that use case needs to be just nailed down a little bit more. Like, is it something like, so So that's kind of where this uh, Don Swanson literature-based discovery thing, which is, mm -hmm. I, when I first discovered that, I thought it was really interesting because this, this guy's been around, I mean, he's passed away now, but he had these ideas in like the 80s or 90s, I think, about you have kind of a body of literature from one space, like it, let's say it's a certain disease you're interested in. And you have this other body of literature that you want to see if there's some kind of meaningful connection between this this set of literature and this set of literature. So maybe it's it's a drug like aspirin, and this is like uh, I don't know some some disease like migraines or whatever. I mean that that's an easy one, but let's say it's A and C, and then maybe there's some meaningful like intermediary set of literature that somehow connects this concept with this concept, and then you can start to infer like oh yeah because this thing relates to these papers over here and these papers relate to this paper this is a very meaningful and interesting intersection so that kind of idea of literature-based discovery is i think a cool paradigm to think about and maybe kind of gets at the ideas that they were talking about where it's like oh i know about uh, a cells and b cells and i know about the rainbow effect but i have to also know that this piece is somewhere in the puzzle and i want to get smart results that return things at that intersection so I think mm -hmm. that the ideas that they were kind of talking about are, are very similar to literature-based discovery. And there might be a way to do like a smart literature-based discovery component of search that plugs into the extension stuff. Yeah. And basically, um, hold on, I just lost the train of thought. Um, what, oh, okay. So whatever, because uh, if you think about it, the hydroxychloroquine, let's call it discovery was just a random connection between malarials and binding of the receptor or whatever that was the first piece of news and if you think about it there might be hundreds of such discoveries that researchers just haven't stumbled upon that doesn't mean those are effective and you know those are yet to be validated and tested yeah. but at least those are potential hypotheses yeah so the problem that you described is kind of exactly my thesis area. So these are things that I'm very interested in. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> well, yeah. quantum entanglement. Yeah, more. no, seriously. Yeah. So then I think that that's like an interesting angle for discovery engine or like some kind of related functionality. Maybe that plays into the discovery aspect of smart searches. Cool. Well, yeah, we're definitely like two weeks away from formalizing all of this, um, I think it will come as a convergence of different things from different teams and different like pieces of technology glued together. Uh, so yeah, let's just nail the gaggle stuff. Let's get more eyes and 
you know, on, on whatever tables. Uh, let's see what happens with round two progress. I haven't really seen any like meaningful progress in terms of actual like challenge. Not sure if you've been following it. Um, yeah, no, it's just, they just completely switched to like, okay, make our tables nice. And I don't really love that. And so I'm yeah. trying to think about like, that, that's one thing that I, I'm thinking about now is like, what, what do I tell to my team to like motivate them and keep them like on the right path? And I, I think internally within each team, each, each project, like there is enough momentum and impetus, like, okay, we're working on a cool, useful project that is like in the absolute useful. And then it's going to be later a matter of like, who can we connect this to so that it'll be useful? Or like, can we present it at a conference or, or something like that? Um, and so I think there's enough energy yeah. to keep the momentum without being like wedded to Kaggle because we haven't really been too closely following Kaggle because I don't think it's like the best use of our efforts. Yeah, yeah, and you know, never ending problem of keeping people engaged and motivated. But in yeah. in reality, and I feel like the combination of the call was Rockefeller yesterday and uh, call was Kathy today, even though the call with, with Kathy should probably be selectively distributed because yeah. it kind of bashes on a lot of things. It's a little more um, careful, yeah. But I think yeah, the combination of two should serve as a meaningful kind of path, uh, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. No, it, it's becoming like, I think that this, this discovery engine thing is starting to kind of slowly get some more scope or like more definition and becoming clear and there, there's some convergence. So I think that that's really good. Yeah, definitely exciting. So <laughs> yeah, let's, let's figure out the Kaggle thing. Let's touch base tomorrow and yeah see what happens great sounds good yeah if there's ever anything i can do to help you out or just you want to get things off your chest or anything let me know i'm, I'm Perfect. happy to chat really appreciate it all right bye-bye cool. good chatting with you see you later have a good day